So in space, I could be Michael Jordan. I'm serious. In space, I could dunk a basketball because I could defile gravity. Michael Jordan could defile gravity, you know, maybe not anymore. But when he used to play, and he, he defiled it. And I remember wanting to go to space because it was so cool. And um, the, the law of gravity, and I think that's very important for our passage today. Well, what is it? What, must, what goes must Come down. Doesn't matter what it is. No, it doesn't matter, right? Whatever goes up must come down. It's a basic premise on planet Earth. No one can stay up. Everything that goes up must come down, even the stock market. Even winning teams. What, must, what goes up must come down. What was, you know, once young becomes old. This law sort of controls the way we exist as, as people. It, it controls the very existence of how we begin to live a life. But you see, this is the problem. Gravity is something meant for what? Just planet Earth. Gravity wasn't meant to be applied to who? <laughs> Aliens. It wasn't meant to apply to God. But you see, that simple principle, we think that gravity is always a principle that we have to live by. It, it's, we expect, we almost begin to expect certain things to happen in our life because we know that that's what usually happens. And so when it comes in our relationship with God, we begin to apply all the humanistic pre presuppositions we live in our world on who? God. So we begin to say in theology, and some theology is good, and some, you know, here history, and some science, and we say, okay, this is what God can do, and this is what God can't do. This is how God is, and this is not how God is. So we start making these boxes, and we put God in them. And you know what? For a lot of us, sitting here, you have your own God box. You have your own dogma. And you might not even know it, but the way you walk out your relationship with God says that you still believe in the law of gravity, even though it doesn't apply to God at all. And that's what we've been learning, right? We've been learning that God's extension, God's dimension, God, the way he extends, and the degree to which how he can move into our life, in and out of our life, is what? It's limitless. And today, what I want to really challenge us to rethink about is this. If there are no rules, no dogma, how can God begin to start changing your life, start meeting you and, and experiencing God in ways you never experienced before? If you threw out the rules, if you threw out your legalistic expectation and the dogma, what would happen? How would God meet us? And this is the story we're going to go to. Right after John 11, we go to John chapter 12. And what we're going to ask, the question, simple question we're going to ask today is this, is how do we begin to embrace a relationship with God without humanistic dogma, right? Dogma, liturgy, our own expectations. Well, what, what would it look like? How can we embrace a relationship like that? How can we begin that? And I think that Mary, we studied Jesus of how close he was with God. Now we're studying Mary because Mary in scripture was perhaps one of the most closest people to Jesus. And how many people want to be close to Jesus? Uh -huh. Amen? Amen? You want to be close to Jesus. Mary was very close to Jesus, and that's who we're studying in scripture, right? We're studying people that actually, what? Passed the traditional dimension of relationship. Martha, the traditional covenant Christian, Martha, wasn't very close to God. Mary was very close to God. And John 11 was when Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead. And right after that chapter, John chapter 12, Jesus goes back to Bethany to see Mary. And this is the story. So watch. Six days before what? The, the, the Passover. Passover. 
Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Okay, now let's read that statement again and think the law of gravity and how it applies in this passage, right? Six days before the pass Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where? Let's, let's read that part again. Where? Lazarus. Lazarus. Wait, but I thought Lazarus was dead, right? What happened to him? He what? He came back to life? Wait, 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 wait. Unbelievable. I don't think you're getting it. Okay, so he was dead, and then he came back to life. That's what you believe? Is that supposed to happen? That's not supposed to happen. That's a paradox. So, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where he resurrected Lazarus. From, and it says where Lazarus lives. So can you imagine what's going on in John chapter 12 in the mind of Lazarus, Martha, Mary, and the other disciples? Okay, this guy... It's like you going to a funeral and a guy walking out. And you can't probably even conceive that, right? Because it's like, no, that's not possible. But this is what this passage is asserting. That this guy that was dead, he was mummified. You know, he was like a mummy. He comes back from the dead. And he's living and breathing and joking and laughing with his sisters. It's not supposed to happen, right? What the heck is going on? So, and then if you understood that the law of gravity is broken here, it's not supposed to happen. And here a dinner, what, was given in Jesus's, well, I mean, you would want to honor the person that brought someone back from the dead. And of course, I crossed out Martha. Everywhere you find Martha, what is she doing? <laughs> Traditional. Serving, again, boring. But, hey, Martha served. Again, she missed this dramatic, powerful encounter. What, what was going on? While Lazarus was what? Those reclining at the table with him. So a man that was dead came back from the dead and now was alive. Reclining, chilling, eating with Christ. Then it makes more sense in verse 3 why Mary would do what she did, right? Then Mary took about a what? A pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Now, this is two questions you get asked, okay? Jesus wiped the perfume. If you read other parts of the Gospels, Mary did not only just anoint Jesus' feet, but, but his head as well. And Mary comes out and starts wiping her hair on his feet. You guys, are you guys comfortable with that? You're like, stop making it a rot. I mean, stop doing that. No, but seriously, you read this passage, it's weird. If you don't understand the context, it's weird. Mary comes out of nowhere, gets a $10,000 uh, you know, perfume, which is supposed to last you almost a lifetime, and breaks it on Jesus' head and feet. I mean, she's, Jesus is eating, and she's just like, you know? And it, it breaks in his head and you know, starts going to his feet, and now she's wiping it with her hair. If you read this passage... There are no ideas about what norm is. This is all abnormal. Okay? It's not customary for a woman to act like that, especially in ancient times. It's not customary for someone that's dead to be sitting there. It's not customary when Jesus was going to be killed in Bethany because of Lazarus' resurrection. It's not customary for Jesus even to be there. Why? Because it's dangerous. They were looking for him. Everything about this passage... It's odd and not normal. Why? Because there's no dogma there. There's no rules there. And you know what the best part is? 
about this passage is? God did all this. He orchestrated all this. He moved outside of all the boxes, all the dogma, all the physical laws, and he was God. And he created a miracle. Now, if you think about it, you look into your life. A lot of us in this room have something that have died in us. Something that we lost hope in. Something we can't trust anymore. I don't know what happened in your life. But things that happened that defines you. And you know what? When Mary lost her brother, and of course you see why she's so appreciative, and does this extraordinary event, she lost something. Something died in her life she never expected to get back. You guys get what I'm talking about here? She never expected ever again after her brother died that her life would be the same again. She never expected in her whole entire life that anything would be the same again. But of course with God, what? Everything is possible, right? And how does this then apply to us? Well, if you want a relationship with God, that's totally outside of just the physical realm, the legalistic dogma, the liturgy, then you know what? We're going to have to go somewhere deeper into all of our lives. We're going to have to be personal. Can we get a little personal? Uh-uh. Is that okay? Amen? Because God will only be a text or just an idea or simply just a guy we believe in when we're in trouble unless we go to the places in our life we don't want to talk about. For Mary, she did not want to talk about her brother because it, based on physical laws, it was impossible for her to ever see her brother again except after the afterlife. And that's what she expected. And she put that what? What do we call that? Dimension. That limit in her life. But now she experienced a miracle. Something that she thought died came back to life. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what happened to you. But I can honestly tell you, I already know. You know, the world sucks real bad. People suck real bad. Amen? Well, yeah, mm. And sometimes you suck too, right? Tell someone you suck too. You've hurt people. And for, for some of us, this is what um, John Eldridge calls in Sacred Romance, and we're on this whole series in Manhattan, and I love doing it. It's pretty fun. We made pledges to ourselves because of the past events that happened in our life, things that we used to believe in, like hope and love and trust. Those things are all done because of an event that happened to our life. We no longer believe. So we live our life believing. Once in hope, once in love, once in trusting people, once in many dreams, big dreams. For some of us, we had big dreams. And I've seen so many of my friends that, who had big dreams when we were just 16, you know, and, and just dreaming about what we can do for God. All, a lot of them, most of them, every single one of them. Started, started to believe in the law of gravity. Because that's life, right? Everything that goes up must come down. Oh, you know, and people would say to me, oh, why are you even being a pastor, you know? Well, what do you get? People hurt you. People are effed up, messed up. They leave. What's the point of it all? And people start getting real cynical. For some of us here, we trusted in relationships. We got hurt, right? You got burnt. You got betrayed. You got broken. And you go, I can't believe in a world outside of that. I can't see past that. But here is what God's trying to say in this passage. In your relationship with God. How many people, got, how many people believe that God is omnipresent. Okay, that's good news, right? That God is everywhere, which means you will never be what? 
alone. I mean, I mean, was that your song? Very good, very good. I enjoyed it. You know, I like, I like, um, like a blanket in winter time too. I like that verse too. That was, that was good. Uh, you believe that God is omnipresent. And you know what? That's part of the dimension series that we talked about for the last couple of weeks. But this is a new perspective. If gravity says everything that goes up must come down, everything good in life will always come to an end, all those type of laws, those physical laws. Let me tell you, God is not only omnipresent, God is what? Omniscient and omnipotent. What does omnipotent mean? What? All powerful? You believe that? Say amen if you believe that. Why is Mary doing something crazy like this? Because she experienced that God was not just, Jesus was not just omnipresent. She experienced Jesus being what? Omnipotent. And you know what? For a lot of us, we don't believe that God's omnipotent. We just, we just believe by theory. Oh yeah, God's all powerful. What would that mean then in relationship to us? It means that everything that died and you thought that died in your life, everything that you lost hope in, all those dreams, all those brokenness, all that pain, let me just tell you right now, because God is all powerful and because God is in relationship with you, the things that have died can come back Amen. to life. People are like, oh, oh, wait, wait. You, you guys are not getting me. Someone, someone, someone tell somebody, God can bring anything back to life. Tell someone that. So the question then is, the question then is, all right, the question then is, all right, come on, get back here, get back here. I just began preaching now. All right? The, the things that have died, what are the things that have died in your life? The dreams, the hopes, the pains, the relationships, whatever they might be. You think you have to live with that stigma. You think that God is limited to this issue, but let me just tell you right now. God can resurrect anything back from the dead. I don't think you get me, right? Amen. This is like profound stuff. Profound, profound stuff. Let me tell you, nothing is impossible for God. That's the whole point of Christmas, that God, Emmanuel, that God is with us. When God is with us, nothing is impossible. And let me just tell you right now, what God is saying in this passage is whatever died in your life, whatever brought you pain, whatever brought you tragedy, God can resurrect the dead. God can resurrect the false dreams, the, the broken dreams, anything that, the hopes that died, God can resurrect and bring it back to life. Why? Why is that? That's only when you begin to embrace a relationship with God without what? Without our own dogma. Without our own liturgy. Without putting stuff on God and saying, God, this is how you are. No, no, no. First lesson. If you want to begin to, to enter a relationship with God without dogma, without liturgy, without putting our humanistic limitations on God, first you have to understand what? Read that with me. Look, that's good news, amen? Amen? That's good news. That gravity doesn't always have to apply. Meaning, in your relationship with God, you can ask God to resurrect anything. That died in your life. So the question is, what has died in your life? What have you lost that you thought you can never get back? I pray that the Holy Spirit would do in small groups this week and even now start convicting us in parts of our life. We told God and we told ourselves and basically we told the world that we would never get back again. Some people think they can't get innocence back again. Wrong. That's why Jesus died. Some people think they can't get love back again. Wrong. That's why Jesus died. Some people think they'll never get their family back again. Or this person back again. Let me tell you something. With God. Because he is omnipotent. Because he is all powerful. Gravity always doesn't have to apply. So, what have you lost? What's been stolen from you? I think today might be the day where you 
Go to a God, not on a page or a text, but you need to go to the God of the universe and say, God, I believe you can bring this back in my life. Now watch this. Mary does this extreme weird thing before God. And it says that Mary took, what, about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with, his hair, with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the, what, perfume. It's a beautiful, odd picture. And the, I don't know about you, but I know people that are crazy about Christ. How many people know people that are crazy about Christ? You know, they, they're just like, I mean, me, I'm not a very emotional person. But I know people that are like, you know, I, when I went to seminary, when you go to seminary with a very diverse group of believers, especially, you know, uh, there's black believers, there's the Hispanic believers, and there's the Asian believers. Asian believers are, are usually the most boring. Because when you preach, they're just like. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I used to preach in chapel, black believers, Spanish believers, they wouldn't shut up. I would get distracted. I would go, you know, Jesus, <laughs> amen. <laughs> if I say the blood, of, then the black people get up, yeah. And I'm just like, wow, the blood and Jesus. If I put those together, it would be like a riot. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, and uh, when, I, when I went to seminary, it's just this, this diverse group of believers and how they, you know, express their relationship with God. And, and as I met some of them, and I asked them their story, and, you know, they would talk like, you don't know what God is doing. <laughs> They're not even preaching. I was just asking, what happened? You don't know what God has done for my life. And I'm just like, whoa. You know, and, and they just go, God has took me out. You know, of drugs, and, and God has cleansed me, and washed me, gave me a purpose, and put me in a master's program. I'm like, oh, praise, praise the Lord, you know. And, 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 they, and, and they kept going and going and going. And, and why was that? Well, and, and I'm just like embarrassed for them at, at the beginning, because like you're making like a fool of yourself. But I realized that the more extreme your life was in the past, Asian people have extreme lives. They're just, you know, liars. They're just, you know, they hide it well. They are quiet about it, but all of humanity is broken into pieces. And some of these people that share their stories with me, they've experienced God in such an extreme way, such in a powerful way, that they don't give a crap about what the heck you think about God because they haven't met him. If you read the Bible, you read the Bible, every single person that has really encountered the living God, their expressions, no matter how it's expressed, is always directly proportional to the power and the degree, the range and degree of redemption they have experienced in their life. It's directly proportional. For Mary, why is she ex such an extreme case? Doesn't care about the other men, how they look at her, how culture looks at her. Because she has experienced the living God. She's met God. And you know what? Let me just tell you something right now. Forget dogma. Forget all the stuff that I'm talking about. You need to meet God on your own. You want to meet the living God. Because when you meet the living God, and you know He's living, everything changes. Everything changes. We, I mean, I have stories right in this church. Let me pick on somebody. I already prepared. <laughs> Henry Kim. Henry Kim came to this church like four years ago. The most honest, eccentric person. He took Mines Briggs. And you got W-E-R-I-D. <laughs> and you're like, oh. <laughs> And Henry 
is the weirdest person I ever met in my life. And you know what? He's also the deepest pain in the ass I ever experienced in my life as a pastor. I'm serious. Henry would come for the three years. And I remember when we just started this thing. And there was like, you know, 17 people. And we, we had, you know, so much faith. A lot of people were going to come. And he would come to me and say, how do you preach with all those empty chairs? This is pathetic. Why the hell am I even doing media for this? And he would look at me. He goes, why, why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting my time? And I would just want to, like, smash him to the ground. Because, the, the, because you see, a, a person that, you know, that felt like his talent and his ambition was the most important thing, you know, even before God, because, you know, he never experienced the living God. Yeah, that's yet. And then, at a fatal day, and all, all, a lot of crap happened, I could, you know, do a whole movie about it, maybe I should. <laughs> He experienced Christ in a room. And he surrenders everything to Christ. And he says, and, and if you saw him, it's online. You can watch his testimony. When he experienced the living God, it's not, it, it's not superficial or it can't be. See, meeting Jesus and knowing Christ, it can't be artificial. You have to experience it for yourself. And when he met Christ and when we confronted him in that room and he, he gave his life to Jesus, he met Christ. Because after he met Christ, he was a complete different person. He told me I didn't have enough faith. From why you preach. And then he goes, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go tell my parents. Because he was afraid. His greatest fear was, his, you know, disappointing his parents. And this guy who once really ridiculed the pastor, how could he? He went to his house. He went to his dad and mom and said, I don't care if you disown me or if I'm homeless, I'm going to serve Jesus Christ. And then he came to me and said, Pastor Sam, I told my parents that. If I'm homeless, you know, can you feed me? <laughs> what happened? Why? I mean, how does someone go from going to film school, getting into a master program, and you got out of master, to film school in California, and he, he considers all that crap, and, and before he was so ambitious, wanted to be famous, and then after he comes to Christ, he says, who cares about that shit? He just chucks it out, and then says, I want to serve Christ. And he takes his camera. He sells it. Gives it to the church. Just like this woman, right? Everything he has. He puts it before Jesus' feet. I guess if you want to think his hair on Jesus's, that's fine too. It's that extreme. That's kind of actually weird, so let's not think that. But you see, sometimes when you experience God, and you know, this is a challenge for us, some of us. Don't hear about it. That's what Martha did all the time. She heard about it and talked about it and saw it from far away or just close by, but she never really experienced it. I'm letting you know, God is not just omnipresent, he's omnipotent and available at this very moment in this room. And when you walk out of this door, he's available to be met. And when Henry met Christ, everything changed. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everything changed. And sometimes we don't get people how far they go for Christ. Because we've never experienced the degree and the range of how God needs to redeem us. You see, because if, when you read this passage, Mary knew, listen to this, Mary knew that this might be the last time she might see him because she knew because her brother was raised from the dead, the Pharisees and all the religious leaders were plotting historically a lot more. They were going crazy. It was going crazy out of hand. They were trying to kill him at any moment. So it was very dangerous for Jesus to come into Bethany. Get, if you get that, say amen. amen. It was dangerous for him to come to Bethany. It was dangerous for her to do this in front of all these men. It was not really rational. It was surrendering everything. So, how do you meet God? How do you begin to meet God without dogma? 
without our legalistic expectations of God. Second lesson and the last, what is it? Sometimes what? Extremity. Sometimes is the only... Let me just tell you right now. I'll just tell you right now. I love preaching about Jesus Christ. How many people love hearing about Jesus Christ? I, I love Jesus Christ. I, if you come to this church, you're going to hear about Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ... Did I say Jesus Christ enough? Jesus Christ is the only one that could change your life. The pastor can't change your life. The pastor's sermon is nothing compared to meeting the person of Jesus Christ. And what I'm really telling us is you need to meet on your own the person of Jesus Christ like Mary did. And then you will do some extreme things matching, directly proportional to the extremity of Christ and how he redeems you. And you know what? That's the only time you can get it. It can't be produced artificially just because you pray more. No, you need to encounter Christ. And that's the challenge of this month, right? For us to experience Christ in ways we never experienced before. And that's the challenge before us. And I want to pray. Henry, how many, how many more people do we want like you? Just one. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, you might be the weirdest person in the planet, so, you know. Um, but... Just like Mary, and just like Jesus, I think it's time for some of us to encounter Christ again for the very first time so that these stories can come about. Amen? Let's all stand and pray together.